there, I'm Ashok Khosla. Welcome back to The Green Show. In our travels around the country to make this program, we meet many industrialists. We're often told that the environment is not as important as people, and such concerns should not be allowed to hamper economic growth. After all, how can poverty be eliminated unless we create wealth? And that is what they feel industry does. Moreover, they conclude, the forces of the market will take care of all inefficient uses of resources. And in due course, everyone will be well off and happy. But even the most industrialized countries have yet to solve their environment problems, and many even their poverty. It is now becoming obvious that neither the trickle-down solves poverty in a reasonable time frame, nor does affluence lead to environmental quality. Surely there must be ways by which economic development and our natural resource base can both be enhanced at the same time. Our job on The Green Show is to explore with you how we can have our cake and eat it. In this episode of The Green Show, we have Ocean's Vengeance, a report on environmental degradation caused by the tourism industry. Beyond Bottom Lines, how Sanghi Industries' search for cleaner technologies has also helped it book higher profits. And Hot and Cold, an alternative to the use of CFCs in air conditioning and refrigeration. Tourism is one of India's biggest foreign exchange earners. The travel trade brings in not only dollars, but also new ideas, cultures, and global visions. Without an active tourist traffic, the world would certainly be not only more insular, but also a very dull place. Whether you go for relaxation or business, everybody agrees that new places are the sources of renewed energy. But the travel trade brings not only earnings and rejuvenation, it can wreak havoc on our environment. Take the example of the sea resort in Digha on the West Bengal coast, a favorite of weekend travelers from Calcutta. This magnificent beach is being eroded at a rapid rate. Mushrooming hotels vie for prime location on the seaside, destroying the natural barriers that protect the coastline. And now, the ocean seeks vengeance. Will Digha disappear under the waves forever? Let us go there and find out. A short vacation, perhaps over the weekend, and thousands of travel-hungry Calcutans rush to the sea resort at Digha. 250 kilometers from the metropolis, the sprawling seafront on the southern tip of West Bengal offers them the much-needed respite from the hectic pace of city life. The sun, the sand and the surf provide an idyllic setting for a few days of fun. And for once, everyone, young or old, is out to take part in the thrill enjoying oneself without restraint, without a care in the world. The endless waters of the Bay of Bengal and its gently rolling waves weave an enchantment that sends the pulse throbbing and the mind racing. Where on earth would one find such a magnificent expanse of flat, hard beach to behold and wallow in? And it is not just the vast stretches of sea and golden sand that attract the holiday makers to Dega. The undulating sand dunes bordering the beach with their thick forests of tall, swaying casuarina trees and cacti in full blossom render a serenity difficult to imagine in any other crowded and popular beach resort. No wonder the travel trade is booming in Dega. Ever since the seafront was developed as a tourist spot in the mid-60s, vacationers have been thronging the seaside town in hordes in every season throughout the year. Hotels, motels, holiday homes and guest houses too have mushroomed in step with the growing influx of tourists. In the mad scramble for prime spot on or near the beach, buildings were constructed recklessly without ever a thought for the long-term damage they were inflicting on the seaside. The splendid sand dunes were brought down and manicured lawns came up where once stood the lovely and wild casarina groves. Roads, culverts, water pipelines, electric poles and telecommunication links began to dot the vast stretches of the coastline. 
As more and more holiday makers turn to Digha, the tourist trade continues to prosper. With the launching of the new Digha township in recent times, buildings have been coming up with astonishing rapidity all over the virgin terrain. Hotels, restaurants, offices and public buildings are gradually filling up every vacant spot that can be traced near the beach. With such large-scale construction work, the Casarina forests are fast disappearing and the dunes are faced with extinction. Inevitably, shacks and kiosks are making a beeline for prominent space on the beach side. Shopkeepers selling curios and fast foods are setting up their stalls overnight, encroaching on land that is best left untouched. Apart from being eyesores and polluting agents, their contribution to the dwindling greenery in Digha is quite formidable. The sea has not remained a silent spectator of such wanton destruction of nature. Advancing menacingly towards land, it is swiftly washing away large parts of the sandy coastline, even flooding the township to our cyclonic storms. The beach, one of the widest in the world, is shrinking with each passing day, unable to hold out against the rushing waters. If such massive erosion continues, Digha must soon go under the sea. In a knee-jerk reaction, the government has put up boulders along the beach. Such stopgap arrangement, it is hoped, will prevent the seawater from eating up the coastline. But the sea is in no mood to oblige. Despite the elaborate attempt to set up the dike-type embankments, its waters continue to seep through and has advanced as much as 83 meters along the coastline in the last few years. The Bay of Bengal cannot be tamed as easily. What then is the solution? Once upon a time, when the Digha beach was unspoiled by the advent of tourists or encroachments of hotels, the sea used to blow in tons of sand and deposit them on the shore. The dunes thus formed nurtured the Casarina groves and together formed a natural protective barrier against erosion by the sea. The villages, safe behind the greenery, were never inundated by sea water, and the beach, fortified by a natural embankment, remained as firm and wide as it was once famous for. Man-made balustrades are no replacement for such natural fencing. As tourists flocked to the sea resort, Blissfully unaware of the death warrant hanging over its head, Digha fights the battle for its survival. To reclaim its preeminent position as a vacationing spot, the assault on its dunes and greenery must stop. Hotels should be moved away from the beach and no further construction allowed to come up on the seafront. Or else the sea will take its vengeance and gradually devour the coastline. The beach will be permanently submerged and holiday makers will have one less spot to spend their weekends in. There are industrialists who manage to line their pockets with gold while their plants spew out poison and destroy our fragile ecosystem. There are others who simply tighten their belt to make better profits. A few, however, have learned to expand their corporate bottom line without causing major distress to their neighbors. They have found that by innovating and adopting clean technology, both their earnings and their surroundings can be improved. One such company is Sangi Industries in Andhra Pradesh. We now bring you a report on how they have set about making their township, Sanginagar, a better place. Few industries in India are aware of the extent of the damage they inflict on our life support systems by dumping their pollutants and wastes into the environment. 
what not many realize is that controlling pollution during the production process often helps boost the bottom line. Such efforts are therefore environmentally sound as well as financially benefiting. 30 kilometers from Hyderabad is situated Sangi Nagar, the headquarters of the Sangi group of companies. At Sangi Nagar, the experiment with environment-friendly technologies has proved to be immensely successful. Sangi Nagar was about 15 years back totally a barren place. It was a rocky area. Now it is one of the best industrial townships of the country. And it has won several awards. In fact, it was uh, recently on the world map uh, when we hosted the World Chess Championship. And it is totally green. It is absolutely pollution free. It is something to be seen, to be believed. The innovations that have been tried out at the Sangi plants have in all cases paid back rich dividends. We have a, I should say, slightly innovative kind of perspective here in the sense that it's considered as a responsibility to give back what is being taken from the natural resource. To us, planting a few trees is not environmentally fair as it is uh, popularly known. It's not the green look that we want to wear out here. In fact, I think we have a very low publicity profile on environment. But what we believe in is uh, creating an enabling environment where people have an economic model to live by, to have self-respect, and have a clean and healthy surrounding in which they survive. Sangi's main line of business is in polyester filament yarn, or PFY. The plant here is the second largest unit in India and produces 25,000 tons of PFY per annum. Most of the pollution control measures at Sangi are at this plant. The first point where pollution control is visibly effective is at the heat transfer heater. Earlier, the heater was fired by mechanical mixing of air and oil. This usually resulted in an excess oil feed, which translated into a higher carbon content in the emission stack. Things changed when the engineers at Sangi introduced an electronically synchronized system of oil-air flow based on actual measurements. The end result was an optimum combustion reflected in the near suitless emissions. The better economy of the new system also helped lower costs. We started consuming about 2 kg of fuel less per minute, which meant a huge deal to our bottom line also, and a very friendly environment because we had a very clean stack at the HD heater. In fact, this control scheme has been approved by our, uh, the collaborators of our equipment supplier and has become a standard now. Similarly, if you take uh, water effluent from filament yarn plant. It has uh, alcohol content in it. Alcohol is one of the raw materials that goes into the process. Uh, we thought instead of generating this demand and then trying to control it, let's try to curb it at the source. In the PFY plant, the excess inflow of ethylene glycol was controlled by installing extra valves and monitoring meters. The modern monitoring system helped maintain high levels of accuracy at raw material feed points. By removing the possibility of excess ethylene glycol at the source, the problem of high COD was nipped in the bud. Whatever extra cost was incurred was promptly paid back by economy in material use and the resultant improvement in yarn quality, which now fetched a better price in the market. The third front of the Eco Watch program at Sanghi Nagar is at the doffing system where the yarn is wound in 24 bobbins simultaneously at very high speeds. The operation was initially done manually, which resulted in a lot of waste yarn generation during the switching of bobbins. To get around this wastage, Sangi polyesters introduced automatic doffing in their plants. As soon as 10 kilograms of yarn is loaded onto the bobbins, every machine automatically switches the yarn to the next set of spare bobbins without any breakage. Uh, this resulted in uh, two counts. One is our waste was drastically reduced. In fact, uh, today we enjoy a waste generation of about 0.7 percent vis-a-vis an industry average of 2.3 percent for similar plants. Uh, and also every bobbin that went out of our company was of the same weight, which is the same length. So the end user literally generated zero waste. Uh, and I should say that there again has been a, a rebounding effect in the fact that the end user loved this. He was not paying for generating waste. So our sales grew up and our bottom line grew healthier. The last stop at Sangi Industries operation cleanup is at the effluent treatment plant. At most such plants, 
the process ends with the draining out of the treated effluent water. But at Sangi's, the story begins here. The treated water is taken by pipelines to Sangi Farm, seven kilometers away. A thousand hectare plantation has been raised through a network of drip irrigation. The farm, which grows mangoes, papayas, figs, pomegranates, and even strawberries, is irrigated with the treated effluent water. This green oasis, in the midst of a stark rocky landscape, attests to the success Sangi industries have had in enriching the land in the area. By recirculating the effluents produced at the plants, Sangis have basically created a near zero pollution complex. The Sangi example has some wide ranging implications for industry as a whole. Going green does not end with planting a few thousand trees in the backyard. A serious effort has to be made to look beyond mere cost benefit analyses because only a clean and healthy environment can support sustainable economic growth. As the cost of electricity goes up and the thickness of the protective ozone shield goes down, the world is looking for alternatives to the conventional refrigerator which uses hazardous chemicals in its compression cycle. The most viable alternative available today is the vapor absorption technology, invented almost a century ago but long neglected. It uses ammonia as the medium and a simple source of heat is sufficient to drive it. One company in India is currently attempting to make this device more efficient and popular. Let us go over to Pune to take a closer look at their efforts. Power is the lifeblood of any growth process. But in India today, there exists an acute shortage of this very critical input. By the end of the eighth plan period, the shortage of electricity in India will cross 14,000 megawatts. A comparison of electricity and oil price indices over the last 10 years reveals the steep rise in the cost of electricity. Given the situation, it obviously makes sense to economize on the consumption of electricity and use it only where alternate sources of energy are either not available or inapplicable. Air conditioning and refrigeration is one area where technology offers a viable alternative to the use of electricity. Conventional refrigeration systems based on the compressor technology consume a high amount of electricity. For a total refrigeration load of 250,000 tons, the compressor-based technology consumes 200 megawatts of power. Further, these machines use ozone-depleting chlorofluorocarbons as refrigerants. A more energy-efficient and eco-friendly option that is available is vapor absorption technology. The concept of vapor absorption was brought to India a decade back by Thermax. Thermax has consolidated in the business of energy, environment and export, of which our business group deals with uh, energy and environment. Energy from the point of view that we have a technology which we feel is less energy intensive, less resource intensive than what competition gives, which is namely the electricity driven compression chiller. As far as the environment is concerned, we use water as a refrigerant, which is definitely more environment friendly than what the compression equipment use in terms of Freon and CFC refrigerants. Thermax has built up a manufacturing facility at Pune with technology support from Sanyo Electric and today has a 90% market share in vapor absorption machines in India. Any refrigeration system is based on the fact that an evaporating liquid absorbs latent heat from its vicinity. A closed loop of continuous evaporation and compression makes up a refrigeration system. In a vapor absorption chiller, water which is a refrigerant is sprayed in a vacuumized chamber. In partial vacuum, water boils at 3 to 4 degrees centigrade and thus absorbs heat from the water flowing through the chamber in copper tubes, in the process chilling it. The advantages of vapor absorption machines are many. Compressors are electricity guzzlers, while absorption chillers use heat as energy. This single factor vastly reduces operating costs. Further, since there are no moving parts involved in the absorption chillers, they are noiseless and require lesser maintenance. 
The greatest advantage of the absorption chillers is that they are extremely environment friendly because they use water as a refrigerant, while conventional machines use ozone depleting freons. Worldwide, absorption technology has been accepted as a safe and economically viable alternative to compressor based machines and many countries have made a conscious switch to this technology. We have uh, manufacturers of vapor absorption machine primarily concentrated in Japan, Korea and China who almost cater to 80 to 85 percent of the domestic market. Whereas in the Indian situation, the share of absorption technology is still hovering around 15 to 20 percent. Fermax, however, is aiming to change all that. Till date, it has sold 170 machines for process cooling and turnkey air conditioning requirements. The Oberoi Hotel at Bangalore uses a Thermax absorption chiller for their air conditioning requirements. So this equipment is, you, can be used for both process cooling and for comfort air conditioning. And as a matter of fact, uh, we have supplied equipment in India to hotels, hospitals, shopping complexes and uh, even office buildings. Probably the most prestigious job that we are currently executing is uh, we are supplying two machines of 1,000 tons each to uh, BBC in the UK. And uh, the next time, maybe a year from now, when you watch a, a television program on BBC, it's going to be air conditioned by Thermax absorption chillers. Although vapor absorption machines have revolutionized the concept of air conditioning, the spread of the technology has been hampered by a general lack of awareness of its long-run benefits. The success of the 25,000 tons of refrigeration installed by Thermax is proof enough of the viability of the system in Indian conditions. Indian industry, which is increasingly being guided by the needs of international competitiveness, has to adopt changes that take it closer to world standards. However, it must operate within the bounds of domestic resource constraints. It is in this context that industry needs to take a closer look at the absorption technology. With the growing number of environmental catastrophes around us, it is obvious that we cannot hide our heads in the sand for much longer. Time is running out. If we do not address our environmental problems today, then we will not need to worry about other problems at all. Eco-consciousness is rapidly catching up with quality consciousness as a vital precondition for success in business. Smart companies have already woken up to this fact. For others, it will take some time before they realize the massive environmental and social costs we will all have to pay if we don't act fast. We at The Green Show urge the business community not to lie low and join us in the quest for alternatives which can coexist with nature. Thank you.